Well, hello for yous. We're going to be looking at graphs of polynomial functions today, and hopefully by the end of this lesson you can say, I can sketch a function based on the factored forms of its equation and the order of its roots. Now, order doesn't mean, you know, which comes first, which comes second. Order has a different meaning here, and we're going to talk about that when we get to it. Uh, first, we're going to look back at our work for parabolas and see if you can remember some of the stuff that we did with parabolas. Uh, so we're going to do a very rough sketch. Notice I don't have any kind of um, axes scale on here, and that's for a reason. I'm just going to do a rough sketch. I just want to know approximately what this thing looks like. Now there's a couple of things that you can think of here. Uh, when I look at this function, whoops, let's get an actual pen here instead of that. Okay, when I look at this function, I know it's degree 2, so I know it's going to be a parabola. Um, and I know that it's right side up and it's kind of skinny because of this thing in the front. It's positive, so that means our parabola is right side up. So it's something like this. Okay, that's an extremely rough sketch of the parabola. Let's see if we can do a little bit better than that, although that's pretty good for most purposes. Um, we also have the factored form of it, and in factored form, if you remember way back, uh, I can get the zeros or the x-intercepts out of factored form. So if I let this be zero, the values of x that make this thing zero come from the values of x that make each of the brackets zero. So the one value of x that makes this bracket zero would be negative four because if I stick negative four in here, negative four plus four is zero. The other value of x that makes <coughs> this function zero would be three because if I stick three into this bracket, I get three minus three is zero. So negative four and let's say that this is negative 4, and I'll just type right on negative 4 over here. Negative 4 is one of the x-intercepts, and 3 is the other x-intercept. So I know that the parabola goes through those two things, and it's going to look something like that. I could also calculate where its vertex was, because I know the vertex has to be directly in between these two, so it's probably over here somewhere, just a little bit to the uh, to this side of the uh, y-axis. Um, but we're not going to do any kind of that calculation right now. We just want a rough sketch, and this is a rough sketch. Uh, I can also find out where the y-intercept is very easily. When it's in standard form, like this is, uh, the y-intercept occurs when x is 0. So if I sub zeros in for these two things, this is my y-intercept. And this is getting a little bit messy here. But I know that this point down here where it crosses the y-axis happens to be negative 24. Now, so much for my scale. There's not a whole heck of a lot um, here that looks even and scale-like. But if we put these um, numbers on it, that's all we really need is what the numbers say. We don't need it to be um, of an even scale or a definite scale. So what do we know about this function? We know it's right side up. And that is because of the leading coefficient, the leading coefficient is greater than zero. It's positive. So that's one thing that we know about it. It has x-intercepts of negative 4 and 3, and it has a y-intercept of 24 negative 24. Now without doing a whole lot of graphing, we have a lot of information about this thing and we could probably answer some a lot of pretty good questions about this thing too. For instance, I know that this function is bigger than 0 on this arm and on this arm. Um, so it's bigger than 0 whenever x is bigger than 3 or less than negative 4 and it's less than 0 in this section here in between negative 4 and 3. So I do know a whole lot of information about this just with one quick little sketch and it's just a sketch. It's not like we did back in grade 10 where we went over 1 up 1, over 2 up 4, over 3 up whatever. We don't need it that definite anymore. We're just going with a sketch.
So we can do this kind of thing for higher degree polynomials as well. And I've got this function in factored form for a reason, because factored form, we can find out a lot more about it because we know where the zeros are when it's in factored form. So I'm going to show you how to do an interval test and we can sketch it knowing the stuff that we learned about polynomial functions from the last unit as well. Um, but let's take a look at the interval test first and then I'll put the, the information we have from the last functions. So the interval test means that we want to test to see whether this function is going to be positive where this function is going to be positive or negative. Now it switches from positive and negative at the zeros. So on one side of the zero it's positive and then it hits zero and then it's negative. So if we knew where the zeros were, we can do some sort of little test there. Well we do know where the zeros are because I gave this to you in factored form. And so we can just take a look at what all of the zeros are. And the zeros happen to be negative five from this one, negative five, negative three, positive 1, positive 3, and positive 4. And these are all in numeric order. So when I put the intervals in, I know that the in, we want the intervals that are bounded by these zeros. So if this function is going to cross the x-axis at negative 5, negative 3, 1, 3, and 4, then the intervals I want to test to see whether it's positive or negative are from negative infinity to negative 5, this section here, that interval. So from negative infinity to negative 5, then from negative 5 to negative 3, that interval in there. So I'm going to say negative 5 to negative 3. And then from negative 3 to positive 1, negative 3 to positive 1, and 1 to 3, so from 1 to 3, and then we got 3 to 4, so this interval in here, 3 to 4, and then from 4 all the way up to infinity, so from 4 to infinity. Now, I have all of these factors written out because we don't really care exactly what the value of the function is. We just want to know whether the function is going to be positive or negative in that interval. So if I know whether the factors are positive or negative, and I see how many factors are negative or positive, I can figure out what the overall value of the function is going to be. So I'm going to do it for this one first, from negative infinity to negative 5. Now these are really, really big negative numbers. I could just pick a number in that interval, let's say negative 10. Uh, or I can think of them as being really, really big negative numbers. Let's go with that negative 10. Negative 10 plus 5 gives me a negative answer. I don't care what answer it is because negative 10 is just an arbitrary number within that interval. Um, but negative, uh, it's going to be negative just the same. This is going to be negative 2 because if I have a really big negative number and I add 3, I'm not going to get to the positives. Uh, if I have a really big negative number and I subtract 1, it's going to be negative. If I have a big negative number and I subtract 3, it's going to be negative. If I have a big negative number and I add 4, there's no way it's getting to the positives. So it's still going to be negative. Oh, oh and in which case, this is a mistake here. That should be a negative in there. And this is still going to be negative, but it will affect it later on. That wasn't the same as this up here, just in case you were wondering what the mistake was. Okay, so I've got one, two, three, four, five negatives. If I have, and I don't know what these numbers are, I don't know what the value of the factors are, but it doesn't matter. I know that the five of them are negative, and any time I multiply negative numbers, if I have an odd number of negatives, the whole answer is going to be negative. If I have an even number of negatives, the whole answer is going to be positive. So let's take a look at this one again, negative 5 to negative 3. This time it kind of helps to think of the number in there. And a number between negative 3 and negative 5 is negative 4. That's the only number between negative 5 and negative 3. So let's think of this. If I put negative 4 in here and I add 5 to it, that's going to give me, get me to the positives. Negative 4 plus 5 gives me, gets me to the positive side. It's positive 1. Okay, we don't really care that it's positive 1, only that it's positive. So now negative 5 to negative 3, if I've got negative 4 and I add 3 to it, that's still negative. 
If I have negative 4 and I subtract 1, that's negative. Negative 4 and I subtract 3, that's negative. And if I have negative 4 and I subtract 4, that's negative. So this time I have 1, 2, 3, 4 negatives, which means my overall value of the function is positive. Now I'm just going to fill this chart in. So there's our function. It looks like it starts in the negatives, then it goes positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. So what does that mean? Well, way over here from negative infinity to negative 5 in this section, it's in the negative, so it's way down here. So then it comes up and it's 0 at negative 5, and then it flips into the positives until we get to negative 3. So it's up over like that. And I don't really care how high that hump is right now. All I care is it's, it's in the positive section. And then at negative 3, it flips back into the negatives. And it stays negative until we get to 1. And then at 1 to 3, it flips back into the positives, right in here. And then it goes back into the negatives, and then it goes into the positives, and it stays in the positives for infinity. Now let's see if this matches what we know. Um, this thing, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 x's, if I multiplied all those together, this thing is going to have a degree of x to the fifth. So since it's x to the fifth, it's odd, so it has to start and stop in opposite directions, which is good. We've got it starting in the negative and ending in the positive, so it starts and stops in opposite directions. Uh, also, it doesn't have any negatives out front of it, so it's positive, which means that we know that the overall graph, if I zoomed out on this, the overall graph would sort of have a positive slope, so it starts down and ends up. So that matches everything we know. Now, where does the function cross the y-axis? Well, the function crosses the y-axis when x is 0. So we need to evaluate f at 0. f at 0, if I stick 0 into this um, factor, I get 5. If I stick 0 into this factor, I get 3. If I stick 0 into this factor, I get negative 1. If I stick 0 in here, I get negative 3. And if I stick 0 in here, I get negative 4. So, I just multiply all those together and I get negative 180. So that means that right here and again, we're not worried about scale too much here. Right here is negative 180. So this is what our function is going to look like. Um, now, let's have a look at another one. In the example we just completed, there were five distinct factors in factored form. This tells us that there are five x-intercepts or zeros, and the polynomials must have been of degree 5. Not all degree 5 polynomials will have five distinct factors. Take, for instance, this following. It's got two factors that are the same. I could have written that instead of x minus 3 times x minus 3, I could have written it as x minus 3 squared. This is repeated, since that factor is repeated, and there are two of them, so the 0, x equals 3, which is what we get out of here, um, this thing has a 0 of 3, uh, is said to have order 2. In general, if a factor x minus a is repeated n times for a polynomial function, the 0, x equals a will be of order n. Uh, so what happens if I have this repeated factor? What happens to the graph that I'm using, doing? So let's have a look. How does the repeated factor affect the graph? So we're going to sketch this function, and this time I have written it as its um, I've written it as its squared function. But what are the zeros here this time? X equals, the zeros are going to be 3 from this function, or from this factor, negative 4 from this one, negative 5 from this one, and 2 from this one. Now, when we write down our intervals, we have to make sure we put them in order, because we st always start at negative infinity and then go to the smallest zero, which if I look through these things is going to be negative 5. These factors are not in the right order. So negative infinity to negative 5, 
Then we go from negative 5 to the next smallest one, which is going to be negative 4. Then negative 4 to 2, 2 to 3, and 3 to positive infinity. So I'm going to quickly fill out this chart the same way as I did before. So here's the chart, and I filled it in just the same way as I did before, reasoning through what each of these factors were going to be, whether they're going to be positive or negative when my x values were within this interval. And uh, one thing I notice is that my value of the function, it doesn't switch signs at this point. So what this means is it starts negative, so it starts down here, and it goes up to negative 5, flips into the positive, back down to the negative, back up to the positive, and then when it comes down to this 3, it's going to stay positive. It doesn't actually cross. It just touches at 3 and then zooms off to positive infinity. So I want you to notice that here, when we have this, um, this uh, factor with a squared on it, that the 0 that comes from that factor with the squared on it, if you zoom in really close, it looks roughly parabolic. So at the repeated zero, and it says this here, the function does not change signs. This means the graph doesn't cross the x-axis at the point. It only touches it and it actually looks roughly parabolic. Okay, So that's how the factors affecting um, or the exponent is affecting that. And what we actually say is that the zero 3, this 0 is of order 2 because there's an exponent of 2 on it. So next example. Sketch the function f at x equals x minus 3 cubed. Well, what do you think order 3 is going to look like? Uh, x minus, or, and then the rest of the, the function there. And determine the sign of the function in the intervals between the x-intercepts. Now I've set up the intervals for you this time. Uh, this 0 has order 3. And this looks like we've got, since we've got three x's in this one, 1, 2, 3, this thing is of degree 6. So this should start and stop in the same direction, whereas the last ones we did started and stopped in opposite directions. So maybe you should pause this and see if you can fill out the interval table. I'm just going to go and fill out the interval table now. See if you can fill out the interval table and draw this function the way I'm going to do now as well. So good idea to pause this. If you haven't paused it already, pause it now. Now I said pause it now. Now you could have cheated a little bit because you can actually read this. It says this time the sign does, does change at the repeated root. If the repeated root has an even order, the function will not cross the axis at the point. If the zero has an odd order, the function will cross the axis at the zero. But like our power functions, the higher the order of the root, the flatter it will appear at the intercept. So what does that mean? Well, the order of the root here are 3 is of root of order 3. So let's take a look. This is going to start positive, so it starts up here until it hits the negative 5 and it crosses the axis and then comes back up to 4 and crosses the axis again and then it's going to go up here somewhere and come down to 2 and it's going to cross the axis at 2 and then it's going to come up and cross the axis at 3. Now notice when we look at all of these things, if we were to zoom in, this crosses the axis looking roughly linear. Even though it's going to curve later, at the axis it looks kind of linear. However, this 3 over here, this intercept right here at 3 is of order 3. So it's going to flatten out a little bit at the axis and look roughly cubic. Okay. So it looks a little bit cubic when it hits that axis. And it's kind of hard to, to sketch it in a sketch, um, but you have to make it so that it looks somewhat cubic there because it gets flatter at the orders. Okay. Um, so the higher the order of the root, the flatter it's going to be. Odd number roots it actually crosses, so it actually says that here. Uh, if the zero has an odd order, the function will cross the axis. Okay. If it had an even order, 
it did not cross the axis. Okay, so that's the main point here about this interval test. Let's see, is there anything left here? Nope, just the practice questions. So that's it. That is what this thing looks like. Um, and we'll call that there for a day.